On this week's weekend special of the Federalist Files, Project Veritas strikes again, Biden to pull troops out of Afghanistan, how media stokes the flames of division, the scary political double standard, and Michigan State study finds no racial disparities of lethal force in police shootings. Here with all that twisting up the media, okay. you don't know me, but we're gonna, gonna get to know each other. That's what we're gonna know do. Each other, yes, huh? we are. Let's we see. are. We are. How are you gonna know me? I'm gonna, we're gonna talk. I'm gonna share let's a number go. with you. All right, let's do it. No, let's do it right let's here. Let's do it. All right, here's my here's my phone. Let's no, do it. Head camera, I'll talk about something that's real. Tell me what's and real. Y'all just gonna edit out. We're live. We're gonna edit out some other. We're live. We're not fucking live. I'm live right now. I don't care if you live or not. Okay, but get away from here with all that media live. shit that y'all doing. Right now. Look. We're with CNN. Then we're take live. that camera all the way to f there. Then. We are going up there. That's take it all the way to f up there. Y'all doing all the extra uh, for the backhand shit to make listen, people look all crazy than what the f they are. All right, then you watch us because that's where we're going. There. It never ceases to amaze me how fraudulent and how uh, genuflecting the the left wing, the corporate media hacks on CNN are. So welcome to the show, folks. That is a during a that is a protester during uh, the most recent protest in I think it's called Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, from the most recent shooting. Du, du, uh, Duante Wright, I think his name is, or Dante Wright. So that's CNN. They're trying to relate to the people, and the people themselves are calling CNN out. They're saying you're making us look bad, this, that, the other thing, and that's actually not even the truth. That's not the case. CNN never really reports rioting. They always say these protests are mostly peaceful when they aren't. It'll be protests during the day, and then it'll turn into a very deadly and uh, violent riot and loot session from the uh, left-wing actors, the left-wing... I don't even know what to call them, really. The left-wing militia of the Democrat Party. So what I have is I have James O'Keefe... And this was a huge story that came out. James O'Keefe, Project Veritas, strikes again with a uh, CNN technical director. I think his name is Charlie... I'm trying to think his exact name. It was like Charlie Chester. Uh, he admits openly... So I'm going to play... I think I'm going to play two... I'm going to cut this down into two different clips because it's a little bit longer. But he openly admits to the bias that's been pushed and the exalting... Uh, of left-wing politics in CNN's actual <laughs> news station. And when I say news, I say it with, you know, the quote-unquote fingers, news. So check out Play 5. I think I, I think we got him through this term. We would always hear shots of him jogging. Him in aviator shades and, like, a, like you paint him as a young geriatric. We were creating a story there that we didn't know anything about, you know, we were, so that's, that's, I think that's a problem, yeah. I think what we did, we got Trump back. I am 100% going to say it, and I 100% believe it, that if it wasn't for CNN, I don't know that Trump would have gotten voted out. Our focus was to get Trump out of office, right? Without saying it, that's what it was, right? So our next thing is going to be for climate change awareness. Do you think it's going to be just like a lot of like fear? Like, climate. Yeah, fear sells. Fear sells. No one ever says that those things out loud, but it's obvious. And what is that you do? Technical director. It's one step down from director. So what we have here is we have a CNN technical director that claims that he is the second in command in terms of directing on CNN, claiming that they are openly propagandizing on their network. They're painting Joe Biden as a young geriatric. They're showing him with these aviator-style glasses. They show him running, riding a bike, exercising to show that he's supposedly young. Uh, then he also goes on to talk about climate change a little bit. And actually, at one point, he talks about how fear leads and how their next movement is actually going to be to climate change now. And before that, it was uh, COVID, which I also have another clip where he goes on to talk about COVID a little bit. The reason for, and this this is, by the way, everything that I'm stating, and once again, all, obviously everything will be in the show notes. Every single thing I'm referring to will be hyperlinked in the show notes. Uh, I will have a website where you can find all of, this, all of these clips. It's probably going to be off Project Veritas' website. 
if it's still up, if, if AWS hasn't taken that down since we live in like this authoritarian lifestyle. But this is something that the conservatives all knew. We already knew this. It was just, it was statements we would make and then the left would be like, well, you can't substantiate that. That's not true. No, no, no. This is true. We have it now directly from the horse's mouth. We have a CNN executive type level uh, employee telling us exactly what their methodology has been in order to get Trump. He said, if it weren't for, if it wasn't for CNN, Trump would have got voted. We don't know if Trump is, will, would have gotten voted out. So he openly is saying that they have an agenda. And by the way, this is why you don't really hear this about MSNBC because MSNBC is admittedly so liberal left wing. CNN tries to make it like they're an actual news source and in today's day and age, we actually do not have real news anymore at this point. Maybe the only news that you can that you can find, and I don't know if this is exactly true, because in New Jersey, I don't think it's true, your local news station. Because in New Jersey, News 12, I don't think is, um, I think that they're biased, especially like super left wing, wing biased secretly, because the news that they report, they, they report it from a perspective of leftism uh, and leftist ideology, liberalism. So next clip that I have, he's going to talk about the CNN's coverage of COVID as well at the very end, the last maybe 10, 20 seconds of the clip. He's going to also talk about when he looked into the statistics about who it is that is perpetrating these violent acts or these, what, what they would call hate crimes against Asian Americans. Play six. Gangbusters are raving, raiders. Gangbusters are raving, raiders, right? Which is why we can't say the death toll on the side. Let's make it higher. Like, why isn't it high enough, you know, today? Like, it would make our point better if it was higher. It's fear. Like, fear really drives numbers. Fear is the thing that keeps you too thin. If it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. If it bleeds, it leads? Yeah. No, no one ever says it, those things out loud, but it's obvious. Well, they're actually doing, telling the person what to say. It's an art form. It's always leading them in a direction before they even open their mind. It's fear. Like, fear really drives numbers. Fear is the thing that keeps you too bad. I've taught you that I've been, that have been attacking Asian. What are you doing? Like, we're trying to, like, help, like, with the BLM. So the ticker at CNN, when you would go to watch CNN, they would have the COVID death numbers and the COVID race uh, case rate on the CNN site, I mean CNN TV show, pretty much at all times throughout the Trump administration. Once Trump was gone, the very beginning of the Biden administration, you started to notice that it was no longer there. Um, the discussion was no longer as much COVID-19, but now it, is, it has come full circle and we're talking about COVID-19 once again. Because they're looking for a further of a power push. But more importantly, he is saying, uh, what's this guy's name? Charlie Chester, the technical director at CNN. If it leads, it bleeds. We drive people to, we compel people to do things by alone. The idea of fear. We are fear mongerers. And the right wing has called this for a very long time about the left. The left is just, they're fear mongers right now uh, throughout this entire thing. This, this idea, oh, if it saves one life, that's fine. We can do whatever, whatever restrictions you want, government. Oh, First Amendment, yeah, we can, we can, um, we can just suspend the First Amendment. That's okay because if it saves one life, that's okay. That is not the case. And even I hear this, the left wing ideology say, well, why do you need a gun? Why do you need this? Why do you need that? It's not called the Bill of Needs. It's called the Bill of Rights. It's not, It's not. oh, well, we, we should be able to determine, the government should be able to de determine, and the mainstream should be able to determine what you should have and what you can have. And that's really the Democrat ethos. Um, they are getting further and further and closer and closer to communism. Uh, just, just the authoritarian leadings, leanings alone are very, very tantamount to communist like regimes now what they're trying to do is enact that communism through regulation right now and the way in which they're trying to concert with private industry so we've seen oh and then 
just to talk about. And then at the very end, he talks about BLM and he tries to find out who's perpetrating all these crimes against Asian Americans. And then he, he finds the number. He finds that it was actually black Americans that are doing this at a disproportionate rate. And he said he was very disappointed in that because they wanted to paint the narrative. And that gets to the more important part where he says, and at the very end, or kind of in the middle of the video, he says it's always leading them in a direction before they even open their mouths. So what their objective is at CNN, and this is exactly how Pravda worked, is to hit you with so much propaganda over and over again, over and over again, that it's somehow perpetuated everywhere, make it 90% at least of the media, and then perpetuated through social media, perpetuated through um, every single other news station and newspapers as well. Make it so mainstream that you actually believe things that are no lo that are not factually true. And that is the case. And he openly admits to it in this case. Now me, I don't even watch I don't watch Fox News. I used to watch CNN here and there. Fox News in a general sense, I don't really watch much of it. I don't really watch I don't take in a lot of conservative media. There's some people I like to listen to, Steven Crowder, because he's got some comedy, Dan Bongino. I've always kind of listened to Dan for a long time. I was, I'm one of the OG listeners. I was listening to Dan Bongino when he had like a thousand, uh, a thousand followers. Those two, I'll listen to Matt Walsh because Matt Walsh is really, really good on cultural issues. But other than that, that's really it. I would, I was an avid listener, uh, in the last like year or so of Rush Limbaugh, just because I actually kind of discovered Rush Limbaugh. Because I wasn't, you know, I didn't turn into 710 WOR all the time on the radio. So, as I've gotten further and further myself, like, I don't listen to what the pundits on TV say. My What my view is, is my own. I have composed it myself. I have figured it out myself through reasoning. Uh, through reading founding documents. From educating myself as much as I could. Becoming much more uh, well-read on the issues, issues, you know. But other people don't do that. So what I have is, additionally, from doing this, from coming out with this video, you see the 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 communist propaganda machine, and you see private industry pick up and help their buddies at CNN out. You see Twitter suspend James O'Keefe's account, as I have the uh, photo up here. And then on top of that, additionally, and this is just so nobody can get any type of information. Remember, James O'Keefe only has 926,000 followers. I mean, this guy's in a multi-million. He, he doesn't have that many people following him. He's not that mainstream. They'll show him on conservative news outlets. Some of the work, and by the way, this guy, he got tricked like by a Tinder date. This, this girl went on four different dates with him. He went nowhere. He just sat there and bragged about his job pretty much the entire time. He got a couple of drinks in him. And then he just spilled everything, all the bad stuff, all the malfeasance that they've been partaking in over at CNN. So they, Twitter goes ahead, they suspend his account. So then they go on Project Veritas, whose account is not suspended. They put out a statement. It states, I am suing Twitter for defamation because they said I, James O'Keefe, operated fake accounts. This is false. This is defamatory, and they will pay. Section 230 may have protected them before, but it will not protect them from me. The complaint will be filed Monday. So this coming Monday, they're going to be filing a complaint forward. Because Twitter lies. Twitter's just working with their buddies at CNN. These people are all talking to each other. They're all communicating. It's all a concerted, planned effort. And it goes to show, and, and he has exposed this many times on Project Veritas, not only here, but some of the conference calls that they had as well, that they take their orders from the Democrat Party on what to say and what to do. Whereas the right wing, uh, the right wing actually covers, it's very broad and very wide. There's people that are more on the libertarian side, and there's people that are kind of conservative evangelicals, and then there's people that are moderate Republicans. It's very far and wide. So when you tune into specific different shows, they have different takes on all different issues which they don't really have over at CNN. Uh, everybody, it is just a groupthink ideology where they reverberate what the host before them said and what the left wing is telling them to say. So we are living now, and, and I don't like to say the talk about the devolution of, uh, of our society in America, and I think, and this is why, some people tell me, you know, oh, I, I was listening and then I felt like it was too negative and this and that. And listen, this is it. This is the show. 
uh, I'm just, I'm sitting here, I'm shooting it as I see, I, I'm, I am stating it as I am seeing it. I'm illustrating it as it is being put out to me, as I perceive it. And we are living in a, in a current society now where we get, we are getting further and further towards where if you believe one thing, you are considered a second class citizen. You no longer, you get kicked off all of your news sources. You get kicked off of Twitter. I know I, I, ch I have some challenges on Facebook myself, YouTube. I'm, I'm totally throttled. Nobody knows when my content comes out. I have like one, I'll put out videos on Rumble where I'm getting, you know, 50 to a hundred views and then I'll put it out on YouTube. I'm getting zero. So when you think a certain way, certain ideology, they want to crush you. They want to stamp, put their boot on your throat, and they want to, uh, they want you to gas out. That is what they're attempting to do right now. That's their authoritarian tactics. They're looking to take guns. They're going, going now. They're looking to pack the court, and then they're lying about the reason for packing the court. They're saying they're unpacking the court, which doesn't make any sense by adding four justices. You do not unpack the court. They simply just, and that was Jerry Nadler said that, they simply just lie straight to your face and the media covers covers them and carries the water for them. And now we're living in this, this weird society where you are being openly discriminated against. There's a lot of companies coming out saying that they're not going to, they're going to look at your Facebook, they're going to look at all of your personal accounts. Oh, do they lean right? We're not going to hire them. They're openly saying things like that because that's actually still allowed. That's not considered discrimination by uh, Civil Rights Act standards. Meanwhile, if you discriminate, if somebody is tr a transgender, that's discrimination under Title, I think it's called Title IX. So the only thing that actually is not covered under Title IX is political ideology, religion. They can't discriminate everything, and politics in today's day and age is religion at this at this point. So we're just living in this weird kind of. We're getting very. It's getting very dicey. Like I said, I don't like to sit here and report it negatively, but I am stating it as I perceive it to be, and I'm sure many others are noticing this. Uh, I've noticed this actually years ago that not that there was a, uh, I knew that there was always a far right kind of like suppression going on and on the right. And I realized how substantial it was and how broad it actually applied. And additionally, I started to notice the coddling of society or the suppression of society rather maybe five or six years ago when I first started watching, I would watch Joe Rogan clips. I would watch, I'd read the comments, because the comments were hilarious, they were funnier a lot of the time than the video. And some were negative, some were positive, people would fight over things, what have you. And I noticed from one year to the other, that there was no fights anymore. There was no longer any comments that were negative or adverse, where people would go at it back and forth, no cussing, nothing. And I started to notice, okay, so we're getting a censorship of society. Uh, but it, it it never and and I, and then I started to notice too, there was a lot of libertarian right leaning viewers and listeners on the Joe Rogan podcast as well, and I started to notice oh wow, there there are no right wing comments here. So you start to slowly they have been moving, they've been uh, pushing the goalpost over smaller smaller edge, a small augmentations repeatedly just to get away with each little thing every single terms and agreement that you have to agree to uh eventually it's it gets to this point now where you wake up and you realize oh man this is we're, we're at a point now where it's it's too late that's that's kind of the way it's feeling like it's going very slowly but it's getting to that point and why i'm always op optimistic i just do not think that we will go down this way as a country, I cannot see America going down this way. I could see it going down this path, and there will be a strong kickback to the other side. The pendulum always swings politically. I think that will be the case, and that's what I'm hoping for. Because I think there's a lot of people that are that don't want to be censored. They don't want they want to live in the real life society that they grew up in. And I'm kind of part of that weird era where I'm technically a millennial. 
I was born in like 93. I'm technically a millennial, but I still kind of live in that old world a little bit. Like when I was in high school, comparatively, what you could say, what you could joke around with your friends, whether, and it didn't matter what race they were, whether you're white, black, Hispanic, Asian, Indian, whatever you were, you could say whatever you wanted to the other, and you guys could mess around because you guys were friends and it was cool. You guys put in the same sport teams together, but now we're getting further and further to the, to the point where there's words that are restricted from our vocabulary. And once again, it's not like I'm saying the N word. I'm saying like uh, you can't say you can't say certain uh, gay epithets. There's there's a bunch of things that that you are not allowed to say by what society tells you. So go on. <clears throat> Biden plans to follow through with Trump's plan to pull out of Afghanistan. And this is, once again, this is how, and this shows, this is a direct representation of the way the left wing corporate media covers uh, the Democrat and the Republican side. So this is a CNBC article, and it states, and I'm trying to find, I did not have the author here, my apologies. It's written by Amanda Macias, because usually I always have the authors give them a hat tip. So it says, in February 2020, the Trump administration brokered a deal with the Taliban that would usher in a permanent ceasefire and reduce further the U.S. military footprint from approximately 13,000 troops to 8,600 by mid-July last year. By May 2021, all foreign forces would leave Afghanistan. According to the deal, the majority of troops in the country are from Europe. And partner nations, about 2,500 U.S. service members are now in Afghanistan under the agreement. The Taliban promised it would stop terrorist groups from using Afghanistan as a base to launch attacks against the U.S. or its allies. And agreed to conduct peace talks with the central government in Kabul. Kabul. Uh, Biden said the U.S. would hold the Taliban to its commitments. So the media is covering this as is a genius move by Joe Biden. Meanwhile, this was planned by the Trump administration. They attempted to thwart Trump's ability to do this by shutting him down in the Defense Act, the last uh, the the last defense bill that they passed through. They had a little section, a provision written in there saying, "You can't pull anybody out until Congress approves of it." Um, and it had to be by a date that he was no longer president. So they they purposefully moved the date so that the Biden administration could do so. Now, personally, I am not a fan of telling your enemy when you are leaving an area because then that leaves you susceptible to get attacked unless if he's saying we're going to leave by this exact date and then decides to pull everyone out a week earlier or something like that to try to trick them. Maybe there's some sort of trickery going on by the administration. But the most important part, the reason I bring up this entire story, is this is the coverage from the the hacks in the media. CNN. I have a tweet from CNN, and this is during the Trump administration when Trump made the announcement that they were looking to pull out of Afghanistan. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg issued a stark warning that any premature withdrawal from Afghanistan could be dangerous a day after reports that President Trump is eyeing a troop drawdown against the advice of the nation's top military officials. So we're, we should worry about what NATO has to say. We should worry about what some sort of world organization has to say about how America handles themselves. Once again, groupism, groupthink, the idea that other countries should have a say in the way in which Americans are treated and what Americans' rights are is a serious problem. So then, to go on, CNN, this is what they tweeted just the other day, about the exact same move from the Biden administration. As President Biden prepares to lay out his plan to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan, a source familiar with his thinking tells CNN's uh, Cayman Poor that he thinks no amount of U.S. troops in the country can be a game changer anymore. So there is no criticism. It is, Biden is doing this, no problem, that's it. So, to go on, and it gets even worse. The one of them is very groveling, and I think it's this one here. So this is what Trump, this is a comment on Trump. This is just reckless and it is really risky, says Brett Bruin, of Trump's plan to withdraw troops from Afghanistan and Iraq. He says, you're not sharing information with the incoming administration, so the likelihood that something could go very wrong is very, very high. So to go on, this is about This is about President Biden. Former President Obama praised President Biden's bold leadership 
for his decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan by September 11th, saying that it is time to recognize that we have accomplished all that we can military, militarily in America's longest war. So next, another one. This is a uh, piece. Diplomats worry Trump's desire to withdraw U.S. troops risks success of Afghan Taliban talks. So this is about President Biden. President Biden has announced his decision to withdraw American troops from Afghanistan before September 11th, the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon that led the U.S. into its longest war. So next, and this one is from the New York Times. News analysis, and this one's about Trump. The Taliban wanted the U.S. to leave Afghanistan. Turkey wanted the U.S. out of Syria. And North Korea wanted them to stop military exercises with South Korea. Trump has now, to some extent, obliged all three, but without getting much in return. So it's all negative. And then we have Biden administration. And this is quoting Biden. We went to Afghanistan because of a horrific attack that happened 20 years ago. That cannot explain why we should remain there in 2021. So if you notice, there is a political leaning and everything that has to, if you're looking at the photos of these uh, tweets that I'm going to have up on rumble.com, on the left side, or the very first, oh, actually on the left side. So what I have on the left side, that is always going to be the Donald Trump interpretation. When Donald Trump is the president, there is an aim politically to criticize. When Biden is the president, it is just stating facts. Um, one of them is pretty grovelly when they talk about uh, Obama. But other than that, everything is pretty just straight, straight across the board factual. So that's actually what news is supposed to be. News is supposed to be straight facts, uh, which we don't see now. What we see is praising. We see praising from the, from the left-wing media. So, so social media plays a huge role in shaping the public opinion. This is a Bongino piece. And this is, the, this is the big one. You have the Facebook. They thwarted the ability to share uh, the post about the co-founder of BLM buying the $3.2 million worth of real estate. And this was the story that I covered on our last show. This woman, I think she bought like five different houses or four different houses in all these ritzy areas. By the way, every single area she bought a house, it's like 99% white. Or it's, I'm sorry, it's 1% or sub 1% black. So she bought air. She bought houses in areas of of where n essentially no black people live. It just it just it just shows uh, that she's this. This is Marxism. This is communists. They don't walk the walk. They just tell you what to do, and then they go and they do whatever they want. So this is what Candace Owens had to say. A short clip from Fox Play Nine. He's a Marxist, so Marxists steal money from other people and they enrich themselves <laughs> right. until the people that they stole from are poor. And so she has stolen money from other people on the pretext of a lie that is Black Lives Matter. And she's enriched herself yeah. and she's brought four homes. I mean, you have to kind of appreciate the honesty. So Candace Owens is exactly right. This is what Marxist communists do. They take money from others. They enrich themselves. They embrace that and their ideology. And then they tell everyone else, they just flip everybody else the double barrel middle finger. So this BLM co-founder, she came out and actually defended herself. Her answer was something like, well, I'm all about helping black people and my family because they're black, so I'm helping them out. It's just, I mean, I would I would hope if you somehow, if you had millions and millions of dollars that you would somewhat help your family out. I really would because if I had money like that, I would help my family out too. So just, that was just a horrible comeback. So this Bongino piece, it reads, while true reporting from the Post gets censored, leftist propaganda, propaganda gets disseminated and often promoted routinely on social media. The most recent notable bogus story that was hyped by the entirety of the media only to be exposed was the dubious claim from intelligence officials that Russia has been, been paying the Taliban bounties to kill U.S. troops at the timing of that story came as Donald Trump wanted to remove troops from Afghanistan and was confirmed by multiple publications. Once Biden pledged to allow through with that, to follow through with that withdrawal, the story gets debunked days later by U.S. Intel. The timing is interesting for sure, and one is left to wonder how it is that stories keep getting independently verified by various outlets and then turn out to be bunk. 
So Cheryl Atkinson has a running list of bogus, bogus media stories in the Trump era that were damaging to Trump and, and other conservatives. There was a very notable, prominent 153 examples that she actually states. I'm going to have this in the show notes. It's going to be under bogus media stories damaging to Trump, just so you can read through them and just be like, wow, she just debunks every single story. And it's kind of hard because liberals, what they do is they, they go straight down the list. They're like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And you have to sit there and now you got to debunk every single story because uh, the media just lies. And if they can make that myth go everywhere, then it becomes so mainstream that it's now somehow accepted. Their narrative is somehow now expe- accepted. But most importantly, are we to trust our intelligence officials now? Because we've already seen them spy on the Trump team. Um, and, and they spied on the Trump team with information from intelligence, the intelligence community. Because no one actually does their due diligence. And additionally, it is a political hit job. Now, law, the federal law enforcement, the intelligence communities have become politicized to a point where they're going, they're playing politics. So when Trump said he was going to pull... And, and by the way, the fact... This idea that Russia had been paying the Taliban bounties to kill U.S. troops. You don't You don't need... Russia doesn't need to pay the Taliban to kill U.S. troops. The Taliban wants to kill U.S. troops to begin with. This is just obvious. If, if you read anything about international policy and what goes on in these war zones every single day and, and the international politics, you don't need to pay... Russia doesn't have to pay the Taliban to, uh, to put bounties on U.S. troops' heads. So, so this, uh, when I, I remember reading this story, I was like, yeah, this is probably not true. This is probably be a story that they just came up with just to keep Trump in the Middle East. It's very, it's just very telling. So racist, and, and next what I have is this, this racist America narrative that has been extolled by the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party. It is a post-millennial piece. But more importantly, you actually have reporters asking Jen Psaki questions about this. And I think they actually repeat that. They say something like, oh, well, this is something that the Chinese Communist Party has been pushing, how America is so deeply racist. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party has a Holocaust going on, or I'm sorry, a genocide going on in their country. Uh, Play four. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, talking to her group on Wednesday, said that Weiss essentially said that white supremacy is woven into our founding documents and principles. Now, this statement is getting widely criticized as essentially parroting Chinese Communist Party talking points. So, is the president going to remove her from her position as the representative before that body to promote United States values? Is the president going to remove an African-American woman with decades of experience in the Foreign Service who is widely respected around the world from her position as ambassador to the UN? He is not. He will. T- he is proud to have her in that position. He, she is not only qualified, uh, he believes she is exactly the right person in that role at this moment in time. I, I have not seen her comments. I will say that there's no question that there has been a uh, history of institutional racism in this country, and that doesn't require the UN ambassador to confirm that. So that's essentially the same lecture, though, that the Chinese delegation gave Secretary Blinken in Alaska last month. So does the president think our founding documents are racist? Uh, I would say that uh, I will uh, I will leave my comments to speak for themselves. And certainly, I think most people recognize the history of systemic racism in our country. Uh, and uh, she was speaking to that. I forgot to also mention that this was about the UN ambassador. There's been all this news coming out how she's been saying a bunch of anti-America things, such as, you know, that America's systemically racist, that the founding document's racist, that are our principles. And it's very easy to say the word principles, right? So this is what the left wing does. They speak in very broad terms. They say things like, oh, principles, that they don't talk specifically about what specific principles. And the point of doing that is they want to throw everything out. They want to completely get rid of American culture, the American dream, the American ideology, uh, the free freedom principles, the idea and you have your own individual rights to make your own individual decisions, and you have the right to bear arms, you have the right for your First Amendment, your Second Amendment, uh, to be secure in your persons, things of that nature, the Bill of Rights straight down the board. 
this is why the Communist Party, this is why she is amplifying what the Communist Party says in China. And this is why the, Ch the Chinese are smart. They know they know the way all of this works. They know how to enrich themselves and they know how to destroy us from within. And that's what they have been doing this entire time. This is what the Democrat Party has been doing this entire time. There are so many, there, I have this book. Where is it? The Enemies from Within. This guy named Trevor Lawrence, or Trevor Loudon, wrote this book about every single person, and at the, I mean, this is a little dated, it's a couple years old, so not all of them are still in our government, but it's communists that are in America, in our government, they have infiltrated our government, and, and is pervasive in our government, they have instances, they have Elizabeth Warren, they have Bernie Sanders, I mean, Bernie Sanders is obvious that he's a communist, but they have events that they go and they speak at, you go, oh, look, they're, they're associated with this company, and this company's backed by communism, or communists, uh, run this company or they'll go and they'll speak at a literal it'll be called like a communist conference and they'll go speak at that event so they are in our government they have infiltrated our government what they're doing is they're hiding behind the guise of being democrats or being liberals but really that they're, they're nothing of the sort and i refer to them unfortunately sometimes as liberals when they they really aren't they're just far leftist communist authoritarians and that's that's straight up what they are and the reason why they push this idea, this this narrative, where America is systemically racist, America uh, has has racist principles in it, is once you once you equip, you give that distinction, the intent of what America principles are, you say that they are racist, then that is the reason, in modern society, to throw the entire system out the window, when they are able to do that, when they are able to, say that. America in its entirety, with its principles in their entirety, are racist. And they destroy our founding fathers when they destroy statues. It's not the idea, it's not the actual literal destroying of the statues. I mean, that is a problem, obviously. But the bigger problem is the principle behind it. The, the idea behind it is, if you, oh, well, we can destroy these because these people, we found them as racist. So then what stops them from destroying the Constitution, which they have already been stepping all over it? What is to stop them from, from stopping anything, from any idea that any founder had, any idea that any person had? They look back and they go, oh, well, that person owned, that person specifically owned slaves. Or, oh, that person didn't own slaves, but they were part of a system of other people that owned slaves. And they were alive during that time. They didn't do anything to stop it. So they're, they're inherently also racist as well. So they're not to be listened to. This is how this, is how this whole cancel culture, how it continues to flow and the left continues to start to actually begin to eat its own. In the next couple of years, I would, I would assume... Maybe, maybe not because racism in the intersectionality scale of uh, racism may actually beat sexism, but MLK was known to be like a womanizer. He was cheating on his wife, whatever. He was doing his thing. He eventually will be canceled. <laughs> so, so what they're going to do is they're going to keep going on, canceling people, canceling people. When you will no longer, it'll get to the point where you will no longer be able to recognize your country anymore. It'll be so far and so different from what it originally was, the original composition of the country, that it will be unrecognizable to you. And that's the point. That is the reason that they go for this. That's the reason that they, they like to label. They like to use labels of racism or public health crisis. It's anything that can work as a driving agent to help them instill totalitarian power and get the implementation of of total communism or socialism, whatever you want to call it, authoritarian totalitarianism. So to go on, what's the next story? I have a, and, and this is the, once again, obviously, this is the double standard. Police officer won't face charges in fatal shooting of Ashley Babbitt. It's a Fox News piece it's written by Stephanie Pagones. The Department of Justice, DOJ, will not pursue charges against the U.S. Capitol Police officer who allegedly shot and killed Ashley Babbitt during the January 6th riot in Washington, D.C., officials announced Wednesday. An investigation conducted by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia determined that there is insufficient evidence to support a criminal pro uh, prosecution, the department said in a statement. So more importantly, you have Ashley Babbitt unarmed, not resisting arrest. Yeah, she was. She was obviously wasn't in the right place. She did not. She to me from the video that I've seen, there's two. There's three different. I think there's two different clips from two different angles. 
she was fully surrounded by Capitol Police. She was surrounded in front of her, and then behind them, they had, like, riot gear. They were fully tanked up. They had rifles and everything. She did not, from what I saw, pose a, any more of a threat than anybody else that was around her at that time. So if you, if you decided that was a legal shoot, then by that exact same methodology how you reached that conclusion then that would justify killing every single other person that was in the room with her because there is nothing to justify that action from what i have seen uh they have not come out with any information they won't even say who the officer is they won't give the officer's name meanwhile all these blm george floyd um dante wright they have this other kid now in chicago i'm going to try to cover that next show this 13 year old kid that's on the street gang banging with like at 3 o'clock in the morning, running down a deep, dark alley with a gun in his hand, ditches the gun in, in .8, or it's, I'm sorry, 8, in 8 milliseconds, cop has to make a split second, literally a split second decision, shoots the kid, and now there's riots over in Chicago. So this is the double standard. All these cops, their names get released. People are rioting in the streets. People are freaking out. But look, this happens to Ashley Babbitt. She was not armed, not resisting arrest. She was fully, uh, she was covered by cops everywhere, all around her. She was surrounded. And she gets shot and killed. And there is nothing. People are actually laughing. And I'm not kidding when I say this. I, I, I covered this in, a, in one of my very, one of my very first videos. I covered this. There are people that are laughing and happy about it, elated, and they are school teachers that I went to school at the school that they're teaching at, and they are elated. They are so excited about it, and I posted the screenshots too. They are happy. And, and it has nothing to do, this is what we realize now, it has nothing to do with an overstepping of power from the police, police brutality, uh, an overuse of police force. That's not the case. BLM, the whole organization, the whole leftist movement, that is not what is important to them. What is important to them is to dis it, it all has to do with political ideology. So if you're on the right wing, you get shot by police. They're happy. They're excited. They don't care because they want the police to be on there. So they're, they'll use the police when it's expedient for them to shoot you, the conservative, because that's all it's about. It's all about total power and destroying the opposition because they fundamentally because they disagree with you they have been fundamentally taught by the corporate media to hate your guts and anything is justified against you when in essence you as a conservative me me being a conservative it does not affect anybody else's life around me the left wing there there's nothing that i take away from you on the left wing myself that that any right big r right that I take away from my existing political opinion, my existing political motivations, and uh, me being compelled to do political things. It does not take anything, no rights away from you. Now on the left wing, every, almost every single thing that you have, every argument that composes your psyche and your ideology, almost every single one ends in me getting my rights taken away by you. Every single one. Almost, I can't, I cannot think of a, an opinion or an argument that the left wing has that I, that I disagree with, or I agree with, I'm sorry, that I disagree with that doesn't take away uh, my rights for me. And that's the difference. You're, you're right wing. You pretty much want, your idea is like freedom, uh, unfettered almost to a point, freedom, low taxes. If you're left wing, you want uh, gun confiscation, you want to be able to kill children, you want to be able to um, shut down political speech, shut down any speech in a general sense. They want you to force you to do your business by what they say, by what the government tells you to. So you can't, you have to run your business as the government or, or the left or as the left wingers tell you to. You have to pay people according to what the left wing tells you to pay them. Every single thing that they are so motivated and so compelled to act on and every single political ideology, every point, every single focus group tested answer that they have ends in me, in me myself, getting my rights taken away and, and literally like dispersed, just like given. It's like my all pieces of my body. Just here, we're just going to hand out all this dude's rights to everybody else. We are prioritizing one, one group of people over the other. 
And that's what the problem is. And we're doing it through government force. We're not only doing it through government, but we're also doing it through the idea of uh, government threats to private industry as well. So this woman, nothing. No due process, nothing. They're, in this case, they don't even release the officer's name. So no one even knows at this point. And I think that the family should sue the hell out of the government. If you can, anything that you can do, you should sue them. Just to at least get some sort of information out to the public. And I hope that there's a freedom of information request so we can learn more about this case. So here's the, the idea of this defunding the police push. I've reported this before, but I got some more statistics. This is from the Epic Times. Uh, murders rose 56% in major U.S. cities amid the defunding police push. This one's written by Zachary Stiber. He sources the Legal Defense Fund study that found that the rise in homicides in 10 major cities last year coincided with police making fewer arrests and stops. In Chicago, for example... Arrests and stops dropped by 53%, while murders rose 65%. When comparing June 2019 through February 2020 and June 2020 through February 2021. In Minneapolis, and, and so pretty much this idea, this whole defund the police, these riots, all of that happened, all that transpired. The police went forward and they actually were arresting and stopping less people. And there was a skyrocketing in homicides. So Chicago cut approximately $59 million from police in its 2021 budget, largely by axing vacant positions in the force Minneapolis, which, which slashed $7.8 million from its police department in December 2020, approved an infusion of, month, of money a month prior, and backed away from one proposal to decrease the number of police officers and another to entirely dismantle the department. So they cut their budgets big time and they are facing the consequences from it. And I have even more. And th this is this is a huge, and this is how I'm going to actually really end the show. This is my very last article, but I'm going to have a lot of information from this and then I'll have my quick headlines. And this one's very important. I highly suggest you actually check out the piece. It's, on the, it's at theblaze.com and I actually have some of these statistics much more broken down. It's written by Daniel Horowitz. He does a great job. It is statistics debunking racist police narrative. So, <clears throat> it starts off. The intellectual rigor most people apply to the assertion that there is a public policy problem of police shooting unarmed black people. They believe in this premise and take it on faith simply because the media focuses on every single one of them. Even though most of the shootings are justified, it's the ultimate optical illusion the media is able to create the same way it often appears that planes are crashing all the time and that somehow we need systematic ref or systemic reform of flight safety. In February, the Los Angeles-based Skeptic Magazine published a survey showing that roughly half of self-described liberal or very liberal respondents believe 1,000 or more Unarmed black men are killed by police every year. Approximately 35% of them believe that number is as high as 10,000 or more. Even among self-described moderates, 66% believe about 100 or more unarmed black people are killed every year, as well as 54% of self-described conservatives and very conservative respondents. So across the board, because this narrative that has been painted by the media you have people that believe that 1,000 or more unarmed black men are killed every single year by police. Um, that is the liberals, the self-described liberal or very liberal. Some of them, 35% of them, believe that the number is as high as 10,000 or, or more. It's it's insane. So they're so far off. I've, I've done this. I've covered this before. They're so far off. So according to the Washington Post database on police shootings, 18, 18, folks, 18. So so these liberals, they think more, some of them think more than 1,000. Some of them think more than 10,000. And some people say about 100 or more. Not much more, but that's like the moderates believe 100 or more. So according to the Washington Post, a liberal media outlet on police shootings, they have this Washington Post uh, database on police shootings. 18 unarmed black people were killed by police in 2020 and 13 in 2019. It should be noted that unarmed doesn't necessarily mean unarmed. 
In some cases, media reports are often wrong or don't give proper context, such as when the criminal doesn't cooperate and then reaches into his pocket while running away and whips around back at the cops. Other instances include a suspect severely beating another cop or civilian. The overwhelming majority of these cases tend to be justified, if also tragic shootings. So, if somebody is assaulting somebody else with their hands and they get shot, that's actually considered an unarmed uh, killing, is, is what he's really saying. And, th and then scenarios as well as when uh, police think that their lives are in danger or think that the person has a weapon, what have you. So that's still accounted in those numbers there. They're just so, they're off by a factor, these liberals, they're off by a factor in, in the hundreds, uh, in, in the case of 10,000 or more, you are, you are off by a factor in the hundreds. That's how far off you are. That is how, how much the media has just brainwashed our society to look at everything from the scope of race and racism. So he goes on. Likewise, when people were asked what percentage of those killings by police were black, every group overstated the reality by a factor of two to four, including even self-described conservatives. Liberals believe black people accounted for 56 to 60 percent of police shootings. Moderates estimated the share at 46 percent and conservatives ballparked it at 38 percent in reality. So out of all shootings, what percentage of police fatal shootings, what percentage of them are black? In reality, it's 23 to 27% of fatal police shootings in 2019 were of black people. While that is more than their share of the general population, as I've noted many times, given the disparity in violent crime rates and how most murder and armed robbery occur in non-white neighborhoods, the number of fatal shootings per capita is likely gre greater among white people. This is what a Michigan State University study found before the author was fired after woke protesters intimidated the school when authors like Heather McDonald and I began citing it. So Heather McDonald is also pretty strong on this front. She talks about this a lot. So what they're saying is, considering, when you look at a straight number, like 23 to 27%, let's just put it in the middle of 25%. So you say 25% of the black population, they make up for you know 25% of the uh, fatal police shootings. Black Americans also make up 50% of, of murders, um, perpetrators of murder in this country. So if you look at that number, the population of black Americans in, in America, it's usually 16, 17%. It's around there. Uh, that's the number. So you say, oh, well, they're disproportionately represented. There's more, they have a higher percentage in their population. But that does not account for the rate of criminality amongst black Americans. And the disparity comes from more and more interactions with police because they are partaking in more high violent crimes. So this study, I actually took, I read a little bit of it and then I, uh, I took a little clip of it here. And this is, once again, I have, it's, it's going to be linked in the piece, the Michigan State University study. So it states, a persistent point of debate in studying police use of force concerns how to how to calculate racial disparities. Racial disparities in fatal shootings have traditionally been tested by asking whether officers fatally shoot a, a racial group more than some benchmark, such as that group's population proportion in the United States. Disparity is assumed when the rate of fatal shootings deviates from the benchmark. For example, 26% of civilians killed by police shootings in 2015 were black. Even though black civilians... Uh, comprise only 12% of the population. According to this 12% benchmark, more black civilians are fatally shot than we would expect, indicating disparity. News organizations and researchers using the method, um, and there's a bunch of numbers, find robust evidence of anti-black disparity in, disparity in fatal shootings. However, and this is the point that I got to before. However, using population as a benchmark makes the strong assumption that white and black civilians have equal exposure to situations that result in fatal um, officer shootings. If there are racial differences in exposure to these situations, calculations of racial disparity based on population benchmarks will be misleading. Researchers have attempted to avoid this issue by using race-specific violent crime as a benchmark as the majority of... Uh, 
FOIS involved, and, and when I say FOIS, I think it's like fatal officer shootings, as the majority of fatal officer shootings involved armed c- civilians. When violent crime is used as a benchmark, anti-black disparities in in fatal officer shootings disappear or even reverse. So they're saying they either disappear, there's no disparity there, or it's actually the other way around where officers, according to how many instances of uh, violent crime they interact with the white population, they're more often likely to shoot white people than there are black people by this study. And that's what that's what got the uh, authors. There's a couple of them. There's like three or four different authors. I don't remember their names. That's what got them fired. Because it wasn't it didn't go with the uh, the narrative. So it goes on this piece here. And this is very, very important. I highly suggest you uh, show your friends this. Thus this notion that unarmed black people being killed by police is somehow an epidemic is the new ufo sighting it's a myth because if anything the trend is going the other way overall police shootings have been down dramatically as much as 90 percent among nypd officers uh, over the past five decades in 1971 nypd officers discharged their weapon on the street 810 times that number has declined steadily over the years and has remained well below 100 in the recent years and as you can see from that chart there you have over the years how it is uh, pretty steeply declined in the amount of uh, shootings, discharging of weapons of NYPD firearms from 1971 to 2019. So to go on, what is the true epidemic of violence among black people? Black victims of homicide, most often at the hands of other black career criminals who are undeterred because of the wrong publicly Uh, the public policy focus. According to the CDC, the black homicide rate was 12.9 times higher than the white homicide rate from 2010 to 2015. And homicide was the leading cause of of death for black people under 35. How often do you hear that in the news? He writes. So if you're a black American, you are 12.9 times more likely than a white person to be killed by your own race. What's worse is that those numbers have likely deteriorated with the growing crime wave tragically and ironically born out of the policies built upon the lie of police indiscriminately shooting black people thanks to the BLM agenda on policing and sentencing, as well as the effects of rioting. We experienced the sharpest increase in homicides in 2020, a trend that has continued into 2021. So this is where I actually get into another chart as well. And this talks about that exact same uh, study that I mentioned before. It says, Crime expert Sean Kennedy of the Maryland Public Policy Institute estimates there were at least 4,000 excess homicides last year, given that according to the FBI's Uniform Crime Report, the UCR, 55% of homicide victims whose race was known were black. That means that the BLM agenda caused at least 2,200 excess homicides last year, 116 times more than the number of unarmed black people shot by police. The numbers are likely much worse because given the geographical distribution of the excess homicides, they were likely heavily weighted toward black victims as well as black suspects. So we have this crime expert that was looking into the numbers. He said this this year, because of the BLM riots, and this idea of defunding the police, we're looking at an excess of 4,000 more homicides. And they're saying of that, of that, 55% of homicide victims uh, are black. So, and that's from, that's from recent years. So we extrapolate that and you say, so then the BLM agenda at least killed 2,200 black people last year, which is 116 times more than the number of unarmed black people shot by police. So this is the the real epidemic in our society is much more of uh, black marriage can shooting other black Americans. And this this whole defund the police narrative is just not working for us, folks. So this is the this is the study here. And I'm trying to think what the uh, the name I forgot the name of the uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. So the homicides in Chicago up 65%, arrests and stops down 53%. Homicides in New York up 58%, arrests and stops down 38%. Louisville, homicides up 87% and arrests and stops are down 35%. Minneapolis, 
homicides up 64%, stops and arrests down 42%. In Los Angeles, you see a 51% increase in homicides with an arrest and stop rate down 33%. So we're seeing the defund police narrative and the defund police philosophy in action, and it is looking terrible. It is not working, it is ineffective, and is causing much more harm than it is good. So court packing. I have this Fox News piece, and, and this is, once again, where I kind of get to some of these quick headlines here. I have this court packing. Now they're talking about packing the court and adding an additional four more justices. This has nothing to do with balancing out the court. Uh, RGB herself, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, or RBG, whatever the heck her name is, Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself said... This is a terrible idea. This is politicizing. This will further politicize the court, this idea. But they need to, I think, nuke the filibuster in order to do this and get this done. And I just can't can't see them pulling off a nuking of the filibuster because I think you have to reach the spectrum of the filibuster to nuke the filibuster. I'm not sure exactly. And I think there's actually a couple of very, uh, I don't even want to call them moderate Democrats, just Democrats that are in red states that aren't going to vote this through. So I see this as kind of impractical, but I thought it was very funny that Biden at first was, I'm going to create a committee, and then literally two days later, oh, we're deciding to pack the courts, and we have legislation on the books that we're going to go for another four justices because we want to balance out the court system. That's not the way it works. You don't balance out the court system because guess what, folks? The court system isn't supposed to be political, so it shouldn't be, oh, we have more conservatives than this many, so we need to balance it out. That's not the way it works. This is just the left-wing media, as well as Democrats, taking advantage of people that are stupid and know nothing about the way in which our government system is supposed to work and just trying to attempt to re-educate or educate them on how it's supposed to work by telling them fallacious arguments. So American voters, next clip I have, or next uh, source, Breitbart News, American voters oppose woke corporations. This one's written by Jacob Bliss. So in NPR, PBS NewsHour, Marist poll released Thursday found that a majority of Americans oppose woke corporations influencing everyday life. So the poll registered voters, uh, they asked registered voters if they support or oppose American companies using their public role position or events to influence political, cultural, or social change. So, so this is kind of like the positive news, folks. Uh, the findings show that over 58% oppose any type of corporation using its power to influence any type of political, cultural, or social change across the country. Okay, They also show that 35% did support the efforts by woke corporations, while 70% were unsure how to answer. So you have a majority of Americans that, that, that don't like this woke corporation crap. Okay, so the sur and additionally, the survey also asked specifically whether the voter supports or opposes professional sports teams or organizations using their public role position or events to influence political, cultural, or social change. This question raised roughly the same amount of opposition with 56% opposing. The survey found that only 39% supported these efforts to affect American lives, while 5% were unsure how they felt. So I just like how th this is liberalism at its finest is... They think, since this is how they support change, they just tell businesses to do it for them. It's so funny, this, this comp, or this, uh, rather, the, the Democrats that hate the, the rich guys and think the rich guys pay off all the Republicans. Meanwhile, the corporations do the dirty work for the Democrats. So to go on, Arizona Governor Doug Ducey bans private donations for election operations after Zuckerberg... Uh, donated millions for 2020 election. So we're seeing more more and more some of these Republicans are saying we're not taking money from big tech or some of these big organizations that are deciding to destroy you. These big organizations, I am not a fan of boycotts, but I tell you, and you can do whatever you want, it's your money. But I say personally myself, I will take any advantage or any time I can to tell a woke orpor corporation to go screw. For example, I will not drink Coke products now. Uh, now they're apparently now they're backing down Coke on a lot of their what they're saying because they probably lost a tremendous amount of sales. You can do whatever you want, do the best you can. You don't always have to adhere to what I'm just I'm just telling you that these corporations are intent on destroying you. 
and then you go and you support them. I'm not saying that you have to completely cut all corporations off, that these big corporations that are against you, but if you go to Starbucks, let's say, seven times a week, cut it down to two or three times a week. Go to Dunkin' Donuts instead, or go make your coffee at home, or something like that. That's all I'm saying. You can do whatever you want, though. It's your money. So morning consult poll, to add on to that other one, that other poll that I had, finds that 12% of Republicans favor the MLB, uh, especially after their move to move the All-Star game out of Atlanta. So you have a huge drop to begin with. The MLB is hemorrhaging fans because people just, it is not as modern of a sport as basketball, football. And then you turn around and probably a lot of the people that watch the MLB are probably Republicans. You turn around and you flip them the bird. So now only 12% of them find you favorable. So, oh, another one to end. And this is actually very funny. It's substantial, actually. I can't believe I should have put this in the show. So prosecutors dig themselves in a deep hole in the Chauvin trial. Uh, There's been very little media coverage of the Chauvin trial. The prosecutors have actually been making the case for the defense. The defense rest the ca- rests, uh, rested its case a couple days ago. So I think Monday and then this this next week, the jury is going to come out the verdict. They're going to go through their deliberations. But more importantly, this is a Washington Post piece, and they went on with their little propaganda, showing the narrative. But this is, this is what they missed. They missed this very, very... This is like substantial occurrence that came out. And I can't even believe that the media really isn't covering it at all. Could be, the claim is that Derek Chauvin choked out George Floyd. Okay, so they got this guy on the on the on the stand that the prosecutor brought up, and he's like this medical professional. Okay, so Fowler, who is the defense's in cross examination, the defense lawyer, citing no evidence that. Floyd's blood could have contained between 10 and 18 percent of poisonous gas so this was the claim and I think this actually was like a strategic move I think by the defense lawyer defense lawyer went up to this to this testimony to this guy this professional this health professional I can't even remember his name if it's here Tobin is his last name and said well George Floyd could have died from the carbon monoxide from the exhaust of the cars okay so he said Floyd's blood could have contained 10 to 18% of the poisonous gas since he was positioned on the ground near the exhaust pipe of a police squad car. Though the doctor later admitted he wasn't certain the car was running, Fowler admitted his numbers were estimates because he had not seen evidence that Floyd's blood had been tested for the gas. Okay? So Tobin, this guy who is supposed to be the prosecution's witness, comes out and defends and makes a point for the defense in cross-examination. Tobin pointed to autopsy results showing Floyd's blood had an oxygen saturation level of 98%, meaning anything else in his blood would have measured at just 2%, well within the normal range of carbon monoxide in people's blood. So, I have never ever heard of somebody dying from a lack of oxygen that has a oxygen saturation level of 98%, folks. That is not so so this is like this is like unequivocal information here. They had a, they had their professional witness, their expert witness go on the stand and make this case for the defense, which is very damning evidence. So from what I've seen just to conclude wrap up that specific story, I've seen the prosecution go out there and kind of make the case for the defense. And in cross-examination of the witnesses, defense has done a very solid job. The only way I see the jury going out with a guilty verdict is they are afraid for their lives of BLM and Antifa protesters destroying them and their families. But otherwise, I do actually see this going to whether it's a not guilty or it is a much lower charge uh, than was originally brought up, uh, brought up on Chauvin which will ensue in riots, mass riots, and they're going to tr- attempt to destroy the country again. So, yeah, so move out of big cities, folks. And then if it if it bleeds into your suburbs, defend your home. I guess that's all I really have to say. So I greatly appreciate everyone for tuning in. I know it was a little somber today. Um, I, it can be very emotional covering this stuff. It is existential to your existence as a conservative that you continue to fight, you continue to say whatever you want. 
I have a very good outlook on the future. I do think that eventually the tide will shift as time goes on. I think it's going to be rough maybe for the next year or two once the midterms hit. We're going to see what happens. But I do think that America will not destroy itself from within. I just can't see us going out that way. Uh, me personally, I'm just I'm just very optimistic about that. I'm not optimistic about many things, but that's something that I'm very optimistic about. So I greatly appreciate everyone for tuning in. Please like, share, subscribe. Drop the mic on people, as in my name, Mike. Let them know about the podcast. Uh, and that is it. Everyone have a great weekend. I greatly appreciate the viewership. Take care. Hey.